I started out in chemistry. I was a chemistry major, and uh, chemistry always intrigued me, and I thought it was a neat thing and so forth uh, until I got into chemistry classes. Then you find out it's very boring. Uh, memorizing chemical structures really doesn't tell you a whole lot. Uh, everything starts to look the same, and you look at a benzene ring and something else, and, and of course you get a test on it. And uh, My chemistry advisor, of course, encouraged me to remain as a chemistry major because it, it kept his quota up, but I can't say that I really enjoyed it. Uh, the aspect of chemistry I see now is very different. This is chemistry run through people, and uh, things are quite a bit different than benzene rings on a page. Uh, and then, uh, in pursuing all that, and of course I, I did get interested at the University of Miami, and I'd never really seen too much addiction problem at Ohio State. Uh, we were in a better neighborhood. Now, if I'd been at Grant Hospital in Columbus, it would have been different. When I went down to the University of Miami and spent three years at Jackson Memorial Hospital, very different. And uh, especially when our department of family practice was in charge of running Ward D, which is the detention ward. And so here I was in family medicine, but I'm really taking care of everybody who had been arrested and was sick for anything uh, before they could go to the actual jail and get bonded out. These are auto wheel accident people. Uh, they had a law at the time then on public drunk. If you were drunk in public, they could arrest you for any reason. Um, and they did. Uh, you could see when the end of the month is coming around, a whole bunch of people were brought in. And then, of course, uh, heroin addicts, lots of heroin addicts. They bring these people in. They were just wandering around the street like zombies, and the police would arrest them. And so they dumped them in Ward D. And when I started there, and I looked and I saw that they were, uh, had, were put them in chains and uh, cells, and this was, like I said, part of the emergency room, but they were in chains and cells. I went, where am I? What year is this? Uh, what country am I in? And then I realized that, and I didn't know anything about heroin addiction at the time, these people were uh, detoxed in short order. Of course, heroin is a very short half-life, and so the drug is out of you quick. In three, four days, boy, these guys are in good shape. They give them a, a, a shave, a shower, clean their clothes, and they look like new people. And the uh, officers there who are corrections officers, not nurses, I remember trying to get the medical record sometime, and they said, For, Doc, forget the medical record. They'll be in and out of before central record ever gets it back to you. And they were right. They kept their own little five by eight cards on each person. They knew them all. They're all repeat offenders. And so I said, don't worry. You're in a 30-day rotation. You'll see this guy again. Well, sure enough, I'd see him two, three times in my 30-day rotation. So this got me to thinking, why on earth does this happen? They clean them up, and they go out, and they come right back that same way. And they had various things for them. They would send them to the uh, various points. There, they had a place called the Dade County Stockade. They taught them how to uh, repair sewing machines and various things like this. Forget it, they were always back. I then later, uh, as Karen mentioned, ended up working in a, uh, along with doing urgent care, uh, participating in a methadone clinic in Lakeland called Lakeland Centers. These are federally approved places and we cover all of Polk Highlands and Hardy County. And I learned a lot more there I, I, than I more than I ever wanted to learn, but I, I learned a lot more, and that has gone on since then. And in trying to put this whole picture together of how this all works, I've sort of made like uh, an old Pink Floyd song, uh, lyrics there, brick in the wall. And so we've got uh, a bunch of bricks that put together here, and we're going to go through them and somewhat in relation to Charlie's drawings as well. Now, the, uh, what people want and what people wish are two different things. And my wife is always very good at this. She's a, a trauma nurse, she mentioned, and she often deals with people in her unit who are stabbed, shot, run over by trucks, uh, thrown out of cars, etc. That's, that's her patients. She really never talks to them. Everyone is on a ventilator. So there's not a lot of conversation going on there. But when she talks with them, when they finally come out, and as soon as they can speak, of course, she gets them out of the unit and they're somewhere else. Uh, and when the families come in, likewise, she's talking to them, and they say, oh, he did this or she did that and so forth. And she learns about their, a little bit about their background and that. And she says, watch their feet. I said, okay. You know, 
looking at people's feet all the time. And uh, her statement is one that means what people really want to do is where their feet take them. Now the lying lips, okay, is something different. Person says, yeah, I want to get off these drugs. I want to stop, I want to, I want to do something better, I want a new life and all this. And when they walk over to their dealer, they walk to all their friends who've been, they, they've right been doing drugs before they got here, you know what they want. The podiatrist here trumps the psychiatrist, okay? Watch their feet and you'll see. These people uh, many times are, are so in love with the drug that um, there are many aspects of this that are very much like a love affair. When we talk about chemistry, this is one of those undefinable chemical things. Um, you may see someone that just takes your breath away. I, you know, beware of that person, believe me, especially if you're married to somebody else. Uh, <laughs> no good is going to come with this, I can tell you. But people say, well, there was a chemistry there. Well, do people know what they're getting into when they get into these drugs, when they grab that handful of pills or whatever? Uh, almost uh, assuredly not likely, not likely. Now, the physical aspects of this, we're just going through all of our bricks here. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on too much, Charlie covered it very well, uh, but our bodies, minds are all part of this and it's kind of hard to separate one from the other. In, in medicine we used to because you have all the departments, the department of psychiatry, generally didn't talk to the department of medicine and so forth, and they had all these turf things and I, I've never forgotten going to a grand rounds at Ohio State and um, all the chairman, chairman plural of the departments were always trying to one up the other one. The infectious disease guys are always lording it over the surgeons who wouldn't know a bug if they saw it, you know. Uh, and the internists uh, always felt the shrinks were like voodoo workers or something. And so when this lady who had a severe depression uh, was presented at Grand Rounds, this was really to make fun and put down the psychiatrist. And this lady was depressed, she was very depressed. And uh, we didn't have as good a test for depression then as we have now, but we did have a test. They had the PBI test then, which was adequate. Well then psychiatrists of course never checked that test. They just, she's very depressing. And of course they wanted to have electroshock therapy, which is still done to this day for severe cases. Uh, and that's what they wanted to do with her. And you had to be in pretty good shape. If you ever seen anybody that received electroshock therapy, you've got to be in good shape. Um, or you won't be in any shape when you get through with it. So they had to have an internal medicine consultation. Well, they did one of these tests, and of course, this lady was profoundly hypothyroid, uh, severely down, uh, really almost going to what is called myxedema or myxedema coma, uh, that the psychiatrist, of course, didn't check out. And uh, they gave her some thyroid, and of course, she walked out of the hospital a happy person. Uh, we have to look at the whole person. Everything is all together, the medical, the spiritual, uh, the psychological things, uh, all make up uh, an individual. The uh, physical part is uh, is important. I never denigrate that. I'm very much into physical fitness, good nutrition. I used to have a shirt uh, that said on the front, food is medicine. On the back it said exercise is medicine. Uh, someone took it. I don't have it anymore. But I remember what it said on the shirt. And so should you. All this goes good nutrition, good exercise, um, uh, and both endurance and strength building. Uh, very important. Now in the comorbidities, many of our people come in, you know, yes they've done this, but many of the people have what we call comorbidities. Comorbidities are things they already have, including ADD, ADHD, SAD, DAD, MAD, uh, they're mad at the world, they, uh, PTSD, uh, bipolar, you name it, they've got it. Okay, and so here again is this line, and I just draw this line, and if you're on this line, I just call that Blah. That was someone has no personality, nothing. Charlie's line is more likely, okay? And that is normal. That's the normal person. But many of our people come in with, and you can guess what this one is. They may have some good days, but their days are never that great. They're always below the line. They never get above it like a normal person. And this is called unipolar depression. Okay, now when I was in school we never called it unipolar depression because there was no bipolar depression then, that was a, a newer term. Uh, you invent new terms to stay old things from things that have changed like 
nobody had an acoustic guitar until there was an electric one. Okay, it was just a guitar. Okay, this is just depression. Uh, now it's unipolar depression. But if you have this here, like that, what is that one? Bipolar. That's bipolar, yeah. And that's on their own. That's not with any drug assist. Now, if you were down here and you're bipolar, what are you likely to do? Make yourself feel better. And you find a, uh, there's a plethora of drugs they could use. They uh, may use uh, cocaine, amphetamines, stimulants to lift them up from there. But the euphoria sometimes gets out of control and they'll even realize it's out of control and then they're gonna use Xanax and the other uh, benzo group there. So do know your comorbidities. Uh, the average time it takes to make a diagnosis, and, and I'll give you well, just one, bipolar disorder, is eight years. The people have been walking around uh, with this condition, which will show up on a PET scan, by the way, it's a, this is a real thing. Eight years to make the diagnosis. And the things they've been treating themselves with really don't help. They give a temporary help, of course, uh, but they really don't help that much. When they get in the drug thing, then you have to superimpose Charlie's drawing on this one. Boy, what a mess that person is. That's the self-treated, the self-medicated uh, bipolar. In fact, uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, came out some time ago as far as, you know, why do people use drugs? And they came up with, they spent, you know, like a million dollars over taxpayer money to find out that, and I would have told them this a lot cheaper, but uh, basically, get high or self-medicate. But there is this overlap. And remember that many of the people we're dealing with do have that overlap. And so they're going to have some of these other psychological comorbidities. Uh, I always treat the addiction first, but then I treat the comorbidities. So make sure that they uh, get help if you've identified these. And um, yes, the, uh, all the psychiatry is a bit of a soft diagnostic thing. We don't really have a blood test. I like blood tests, but we don't have a blood test for that. Um, the PET scan is used in research, but it really isn't clinically available yet. Just order one and say, is this guy really got this or is he just flim flamming people? Um, there are enough different things, enough mood questionnaires out there that you can get that are very helpful. You don't have to be a shrink to do this. You can, you can uh, make inquiries and talk to these people and you see these people are different. And if you get a chance to talk to the families, you talk to the family and say, you know what? My son just, you know, he was, he was never happy. You know, growing up, he was just never happy. And this is before he got into drugs. So do a timeline on these things to see, you know, is this a drug-induced psychopathology or was this pre-existing? Uh, also for the alcoholics, very important to do uh, timelines on these people. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the uh, neurochemical thing because we're gonna have a uh, video on that. It'll have some nice animations and we're also going to have uh, a discussion of uh, the drugs individually and some uh, tips on these things and we'll get into some of that neuropharmacology there. But I will bring up uh, an example of someone who probably does have uh, some problems there and this is a, um, a friend of mine, a man that I've known for many years and was a very moral man. He was youth director in my church in Winter Haven. He moved and uh, I would hear from time to time about him and it was always good things. It was never anything bad. He had a good job. He had a wife. They ended up having, he was, had a newborn then, and the newborn is uh, 16 now, so that's how many years I've known him. And when he called me up to see me, and, and my, especially his family practice and addictions, I figured, well, why is he coming to see me? I'm not really sure why. Uh, I specialize in taking care of the uninsured people. I specify uninsured. Um, and I was sure that he had probably had insurance, he worked for a good uh, medical equipment company, had a big sales region, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it turns out, of course, he did come in for addictions. He sucked on opiates. And how did this happen? How did this guy who didn't smoke cigarettes, no history of addiction in the family, uh, didn't drink, is now ordering poppy pods off the internet? 600 bucks, okay? from France. I said, what on earth? And he told me a story, no doubt, this man was addicted. He had a back injury, they gave him oxycodone for his back, and 
He was probably one of these psychopathology people. Uh, and he said, I have never felt this good in my life. Nothing. And he had been to other doctors for these depressions. and Nothing worked. Nothing worked. And one of the tip-offs, by the way, for a bipolar is that they failed three antidepressants. And they say, none of these antidepressants work. May well be. Antidepressants are not the treatment for bipolar. So um, but, uh, anti standard antidepressant failures are a good sign. You may be dealing with something like this. Anyway, uh, wow, oxycodone. Now, that's not my treatment of choice for bipolar either, but uh, it sure made him feel good. And he says, I just felt normal. I just felt normal. But unfortunately, the tolerance kicks in and so forth. And, uh, and the doctors cut him off because the back injury was fixed. They, they uh, had surgery, had the disc removed. He said, you don't need these anymore. Of course, then he went and started in withdrawal. He hadn't experienced that before. It's a new thing, most unpleasant. And uh, next thing you know, he's on the internet buying poppy pods. Uh, they tested, his drug screen tested positive for uh, morphine. Now, uh, what is with this guy? Well, he probably is and has been a hidden bipolar. He's 30 some years old now. Never treated for that. Got a real boost from opiates, which is common. Bipolar people often migrate to opiates very common thing because it makes them feel better and if they've never been above this line or been all over this line this is even better than they're just the ordinary person taking this stuff so uh, they get a bigger bang for the buck and they're more likely to stick with it uh, to the bitter end now uh, is everybody here familiar with Porcharsky's uh, stages of readiness to change you all learned that okay uh, this group, uh, this is very big in the addiction literature, uh, did this primarily on smoking cessation was their model, but it really works for all of our uh, people here. In fact, uh, just to summarize it here, our job is to move these people along these stages of readiness to change, motivational interviewing, motivational uh, urging on these people to get them to move along. And I just use an example uh, uh, with my patients when I'm talking to them is the example of marriage, okay? Um, at some point in your life, uh, for anybody who's married here, you probably weren't thinking about it. That's the pre-contemplative stage. It wasn't really on your mind. You're playing in a sandbox. You're going down to the slide at school or something. That's probably not big on your mind. Uh, later on, uh, it may cross your mind, but you're really not thinking about it. Now, if you meet somebody special, this person is different from other people we've known, uh, you maybe start thinking, well, you know, I'd like to spend more time with this person. I'd like to spend a lot of time with this person. And then finally, you might think, I want to spend all my time with this person. And so now you're in the contemplative stage. You're thinking about this. If you're a man, you're going to ask this person to marry you. Uh, you're now going to the action phase. Say, I'm going to do something, and that's when you get a plan together. You get a plan, so, you know what I do when I ask her to marry me, you know, what if she says no, you know, uh, maybe we haven't thought this through. You get, you know, anxieties, and then you think it's the right thing, and so forth. And finally, you do. Now you've gone that, into that action stage. Now the commitment phase, and I'm uh, changing Procharsky's words somewhat here. The commitment phase is getting married and showing up. The runaway bride did not do the commitment phase. Okay, he fell short. <laughs> uh, but that day you're married, when I ask people, what, what was your status the day before you got married? What would you say? Not married, single, exactly. So all of a sudden, you're not married, you're single, and the next day you're married. Now I tell people, you better be starting to think like a married person that day. Because if you don't, you're going to be in a heap of trouble. If on during that uh, honeymoon, when you got married to Mary, and you have a craving for Sue, this is not good. This could be the end of this wonderful time. So you need to be thinking like a married person. Now, you don't have to take a course, and I do advise counseling for people so they know what they're getting into. But uh, if you're there, and you're married, be thinking like a married person. 
So if you're uh, coming here and you're in an abstinence program, you'd better be thinking about not using drugs. And think of how would a non-addict approach this? I don't know. It's been so long. <laughs> well, if the unmarried person can learn, you know, certain things about their members, like not going to singles bars, wouldn't that be a good suggestion? Okay, very good suggestion, yes. Uh, hanging out with all your single friends. Not, probably not a great thing to do. Wow, you could hang around with some married people. You could do like couples things and so forth. There are certain common sense things here that people could do. And, you know, like my smokers. <laughs> I said, you have to start thinking like, oh, I get so nervous. Well, I get nervous, do I go for a cigarette? No, why, because I'm a non-smoker. I have to think of something else to do, okay? Some kind of non-dangerous substance. Now, uh, so anyway, in, through motivation, and everybody's got a different one, and that's why it comes down to treating the individual. Everybody's going to be different. What motivates one person doesn't motivate somebody else. I may have dead ears. And you speak to them and shh, nothing, just not getting through to this person at all. But everybody has to have some motivation, or guess what? They're not going to change. They have no motivation, you haven't hit on they they're not going to change. Now, um, the vulnerable person, does everybody get hooked on drugs? Who takes, goes to the dentist, got a toothache, gave you a Vicodin prescription. Does everybody come home a drug addict? No, no. There has to be some vulnerability, but the vulnerability is biochemical, but it's also situational, environmental, and so forth. There are uh, people who will, and I've had people hooked from the dentist. The dentist didn't know he was doing this. I mean, he wasn't trying to get him into it. He wasn't a pain clinic. Uh, but lo and behold, the person said, those Vicodins were good. They were good. And I, I really like them. What toothache? You know, uh, <laughs> I should get a toothache every day. And they're going to give me this. Well, they've worked out these percentages, and it's 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 not that high. It's eight or nine percent. I think that the number. I don't have a figure for the Roxies. I call them Oxy Roxy, knock off your Soxy. Uh, they, I think, are a higher number. They go into your bloodstream more quickly to a higher level than, say, the Vicodin does, even though chemically they're similar. And I think that has a big play there because heroin is rated as a 23% addiction rate from your initial use. Uh, the opiates are listed as eight, and again, I think that the stronger opiates now are higher than that. Uh, uh, others are in between there, are the uh, meth and so forth, all around eight, nine percent. All those drugs, including marijuana, is nine percent a marijuana number. And they get hooked on this. It is and definitely is an addicting drug. Now, uh, work is part of our uh, therapy here, and work is good. And I have to tell you, uh, scripturally, work came before the fall. Work is not punishment. Work is not you have to work like a slave for the rest of your life. No, work is a benefit of God. It is a blessing. And for all my unemployed people, and again, because I treat the uninsured, most of these people are unemployed. And we have a horrible economy. Well, guess what? You can get a job and you can do something. Taco Bell is hiring. Now, and I tell these people, they were working 40 hours a week. They get laid off their whole department is downsized and they're out of work. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I, you know, I, I looked on the internet. Okay, what else you do? You know, well, I talked to some friends. Well, most of their friends are unemployed. That's probably not a big help, okay? Uh, I said, well, if you're unemployed, you're, that's a misnomer. You just changed jobs. Your job now is getting a job. And if you work 40 hours a week, at your job, you can work 40 hours a week getting a job. And if you did that, you probably will get one. So I tell them this, bless them and go. Go find one. Now, um, the, uh, I don't know if the department, of, your department of corrections guy, or was this a politician guy that didn't want to treat anybody and yeah. just put him down? Well, you know, this is a very conflicted story. I, I had uh, read a, a Polk Pulse, I'm in Polk County, and a Polk Pulse is a uh, a little uh, non-scientific 
uh, question answer thing they put out in the paper daily in the Lincoln Ledger. And they had asked uh, what people should do with drug offenders. So, well, it was almost 50-50 split to you know, help them, counsel them, do this, or throw away the key. 50-50. That's what the public thinks. This is like two weeks ago. Okay, so you know what you're dealing with. You know, how do people just get rid of them? Put them away, get them off the street, get them out of my 7-Eleven, et cetera. Uh, so it's very conflicted there. And I think that's conflicted also because of all these things here. It's, it's, it is chemistry, but it's more than chemistry. It is a disease, but it's more than a disease. It is a big picture. And in putting these uh, together, uh, I've just come up with the uh, conclusion in my own mind when I think of these people when they come in and see me, because I get conflicted too, sometimes I get so mad at these people. Uh, but I, I know they're humankind just like I am. They have all the same doubts, fears, anxieties of life. They have sought uh, bad ways of dealing with it. And I know a better way, and I said, well, I owe it to them to help them, not just uh, berate them, yell at them, just don't do this drug anymore. Just say no. Um, I mean, I'd love it if that worked, but uh, it's much bigger than that. And it's because it is a spiritual problem, it is a chemical problem, it is a disease, but it's also a moral question of what do you do with your disease? Now, you mentioned hypertension. Um, diabetes, I, I'm a family physician, I treat all these conditions, heart disease and so on and so forth. Uh, emphysema, guy comes in emphysema, well obviously I don't have any smoking in my office, but um, what would you suggest to this guy who has emphysema and is smoking? Hey, stop smoking, hey, wow, okay, I, I agree, I agree. Uh, and yet, uh, he has an addiction, doesn't he? What is that number for nicotine compared to heroin, 23%, opiates, 8, 9, 10%, marijuana, 9%. What's the percentage of people that get hooked on nicotine after they first start smoking? 32%, the highest of them all. Okay. Does this lead to bad things happening? My mother died of emphysema. I, I watched my dad carry those oxygen bottles around, eight years sucking on the pipe. Um, was most unpleasant. Wasted away to 94 pounds. Uh, actually, 15 years of shutting off all social engagements. She was too embarrassed for anyone to see her with oxygen going. You know, I mean, sad, so sad. And there's a, but really, it's a drug addiction. Now, you can send them to a pulmonologist. You can do all those things. And actually, the, I've heard some very good pulmonology speakers on this subject, and they go over all the things. They can do lung reduction surgery. They can give them, you know, you know, two bags of inhalers. They can, you know, write the oxygen prescription and blah, blah, blah. But they all say the same thing. If you don't get your patient to stop smoking and forget everything else, I'm going to tell you. So the biggest thing there in their disease is their other disease. Okay, their addictive disease becomes more important is they're getting better than the result of it, which is treatable medically to some extent, uh, but they're left with it. Well, I'm going to leave you with the, uh, the story of the smartest man I've ever met. Um, we, one of the things we need to do, of course, is offer everybody we see some kind of an exit strategy. How do you get out of this? You got into it, but how are you going to get out of it? Well, this man uh, was amazing. Now, no, 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 he was not a PhD, wasn't an MD, wasn't a corporation president, wasn't a politician, wasn't any of these things. The guy was a pipe fitter. And, and I say the smartest man I've ever met because uh, I had just started in my work in addictions and I was still doing urgent care and we did physicals and ex uh, various uh, employee surveillance for power companies. We had a contract with all the power companies in Polk bunch of new ones coming in at the time. This is in the uh, middle, late 90s. And this guy came in for a physical. And you'd watch these people come through um, as these power plants were being built. I could tell, I never, uh, I actually I did go out and visit these sites and went out to these power plants, but I didn't even have to go out to the sites because I could tell where they were in the construction by who I was doing physicals on. I'm doing bulldozer operators and all these people I know they're clearing the land and pretty soon I'm doing 
this kind of a guy and that kind of a guy. And then we'd do in the pipe fitters and a whole bunch of pipe fitters would come in. And so he was one of these and he knew somehow, I, I mean, I'd mentioned him, he knew I was doing some work in addictions. And he said, um, I gotta tell you about my story. He said, look, you pass your drug screen, you do not need to tell me anything. In fact, the very fact you got here means you're in, okay? He says, no, I gotta tell you. So he told me his story. And he had used maybe some marijuana or something, but nothing too big. And um, he lived in Arkansas. And this buddy of his, a good friend, said, look, you haven't felt anything. You need some heroin. Let me shoot you up with some heroin. This will make you feel better than anything you've ever experienced. And I said, mm, okay. <laughs> like, you like some gum? You know, sure, okay, shoot me up with heroin. Well, the guy did, he shot him with heroin. And the drug was just as promised. The guy felt wonderful. Never had anything like this before. Well, what happened? Again, heroin, short acting drug, three for our half life. Drug wears off. That night, the guy goes into his house, he was single, goes into his house, packs all of his belongings, put them in the car, drives off and never went back. And that was five years before he talked to me about this. And he told me, he says, Doc, that was so good that I knew if I ever did this second time, I would never leave it. And he drove off and he never went back. He had an exit strategy. Now, we maybe can't offer anything quite as dramatic as that <laughs> for everybody that's here, but we can certainly get them on the road to it. We can use all of our uh, knowledge, expertise, and care. If they don't feel we're caring, then the whole thing is down the drain. Uh, and have tremendous advantages for these people and for our state as a whole. Thank you.